With a population of 14 million, Kinshasa is the largest French-speaking city in the world. The streets are full of activity. Many people get up very early at around 5 a.m. and take on several jobs during the day to get by. Africa News, Palmares, Machets, Lefa, Referent. They can be couriers, sweepers, maggot sellers, or even jewelers. At midday, they count their money, often dreaming of making a fortune. They even dream of wealth in this slum, like 80% of its inhabitants. Albert, a fisherman, lives on less than one pound 50 per day. The country's richest people live just opposite him. <laughs> this apartment complex is reserved for the new upper class and, of course, the millionaires of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's impossible for anyone from the outside to get in. Pali Ipupa is one of these hugely wealthy people that the rest of the country dreams of becoming. Dans mes rêves les plus fous quand j'étais gosse, je n'imaginais pas avoir des voitures, tous ces trucs là, et chanter, être connu à Kinshasa et puis un peu partout en Afrique. Fali Ipupa is the most famous singer in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He performs all over the world with international stars, and he is a multi-millionaire. My guy, I love you, man. I love you too. Fali Ipupa, you know what he's saying? He has just invested over 600,000 pounds for his new home in this Riverside estate. J'aime beaucoup être ici, surtout les dimanches. C'est reposant, vous voyez, comme je suis un amoureux de notre fleuve. Je viens souvent ici avec des amis, avec la famille. Donc j'ai décidé de, de rassembler quelques briques ici. <laughs> Just a few bricks makes this Californian style villa, which stands out hugely here in the Congo, the eighth poorest country in the world. His neighbors are lawyers, financiers, or entrepreneurs who have made their fortune selling raw materials, which the rest of the world is snapping up. The Congo's underground reserves are full of wealth and boost the economy. These people are very wealthy. They could live in London or Miami, but they've chosen to stay here. Fali likes to relax far away from the hustle and bustle of the city center. The Congo River, one of the longest in the world, is the city's playground. But it's also a source of livelihood for fishermen who have quickly recognized him. Fali gets a port employee to distribute a few notes among them. It's the equivalent of six pounds per fisherman, which is the same as an entire working week. C'est des gens qui n'ont pas de même problème que nous. Tu vois, ça veut dire que ils ont, ils travaillent même le dimanche. Et si tu, si on peut toujours euh, donner un petit rien pour ne serait-ce que ramener un petit truc à la maison pour ses enfants, c'est toujours. Euh, je, je le fais toujours hein, hein, avec un bon cœur. There are already 600 millionaires like Fali in the Congo. The Democratic Republic of Congo is the largest country in Central Africa. It's four times the size of France. It has been ravaged repeatedly by war for almost 60 years, 
which has resulted in over six million deaths. The country is also under a dictatorship. Mobutu Sese Seko, nicknamed the Leopard of Zaire, was in power for 32 years. While ruling the country with an iron fist, he embezzled four billion pounds. In 1996, a civil war broke out. Militias supported by neighboring countries enlisted thousands of child soldiers to try and seize the country's wealth. Mobutu, meanwhile, eventually died in exile. Today, entire regions are still unstable in this huge country. Everything still needs to be built, and some businessmen make their fortune amid this chaos. Eric has a huge project at the end of this extremely dangerous road. He is erecting a huge dam to provide the population with electricity. In the east of the country, the Great Lakes region is one of its most beautiful areas, but also one of the most dangerous in Africa, having been in almost permanent war for over 20 years. Robert, a former rebel leader, has become a businessman. He is also a politician. La politique, quand on est député, ça nous empêche pas à faire euh, du business. Robert built his fortune in coal-tan mines. This is an essential ore for the manufacturing of mobile phones. A small town has been created thanks to this businessman's employment. And every day, 3,000 miners also dream of a better life. <laughs> The Congo's underground wealth has really boosted the economy. An upper class is emerging, and in Kinshasa, the capital, new products are appearing. That's about $20. But the majority of the population is still extremely poor. With such disadvantage, these people find refuge in religion, which provides a windfall for corrupt pastors who have practically become stars by selling miracle cures at a high price. We have traveled to one of the most chaotic countries in Africa to understand how its people manage to get by and sometimes even manage to build huge fortunes. In Kinshasa, the roads resemble like battered tracks. They are difficult to navigate. In this huge mess, a young woman is fighting for her future. She is called Mukembi. Mukembi is in the middle of a test. Sat in the back, Arnaud must evaluate her ability to sneak through traffic and put a bit of pressure on her. Après, vous allez tourner encore, vous ne pas prendre la droite ici. Vous ne connaissez pas la route, apparemment. Tournez à gauche, allez, prenez la gauche, vous suivez la voiture là. Kokembi has applied for a job as a driver in a startup company. The company was created by a Congolese businesswoman who wants to lift women out of poverty and is recognizable by its pink cars. Mukembe was a nurse until this point. If she passes the test, she will triple her salary, raising it to 200 pounds per month. Je hâte de de commencer mon travail, espérant que ça tienne et le, que le test soit positif. On fait le tour et puis on rentre au bureau. To give herself the best chance, Bukembe stays in character right until the end but it will be a few days until she finds out if she has got the job. There are already about 15 cars in the company's car park. The startup wants to create high-end services for the middle and upper class. 
There are drinks, cakes, and even a Wi-Fi connection to allow clients to work while they sit in Kinshasa's traffic jams. Patricia is a businesswoman who wants to promote female integration. After studying in South Africa, she returned to the Congo. She has created her driver service with the help of investors. She also supports new businesses launched by women. Nous voulons avoir des millionnaires. Le Congo est riche. On a plus de 80 millions d'habitants. On a des ressources, euh, le sol sous sol, et il est temps que la femme congolaise puisse euh, se nourrir de, de cette richesse la congolaise. Despite the instability all over her country. Donnez-moi les deux. Oui, deux cuisses. Voilà. Patricia wants to show the whole world that the Democratic Republic of Congo can take off. Le Congo ne peut pas se résumer au viol, euh, aux guerres. Nous, on a des jeunes et des jeunes gens, des jeunes, des jeunes femmes comme nous, qui essayent par leur façon de faire avancer les choses. Et, euh, et donc, c'est inapproprié qu'on puisse juste résumer la RDC. Non, les choses ne marchent pas, les choses n'évoluent pas. Non, c'est cette nouvelle génération qui va faire émerger le, le pays. Just like Patricia and her friends who are banking on the future of their country, many Congolese people return to work and invest in their country after years of living abroad, especially in Europe or the United States. These repatriates, as they are called, live in secure areas where they can find all of the comforts that they were used to abroad. At La Cité de Fleuve, a complex of high-end apartment buildings and villas extend over 300 hectares and two new people are moving in. Olivier and Naomi. A few days ago, they were still living in Johannesburg, South Africa. C'est vraiment le number one de pri des priorités, vraiment. La machine à laver. Laisse-moi, je savais que d'accord. Et le lit, hein? <laughs> Olivier and Naomi work in finance. They decided to return to their country because there are new professional activities and luxury residences like these. Là, on mettra le salon, un petit salon, on aile, un tapis, une table, une télé. Voilà, ça c'est notre chambre. And it has a breathtaking view of the Congo River. Olivier and Naomi got married in Kinshasa just three days ago, and they want to start their family here. The couple earn 3,000 pounds a month, which is over 100 times the average salary. The rent alone costs almost 1,000 pounds, but that's the price you pay for security. You know, I want a place where my kids can play in the streets, and they don't have to worry about 100 other people on the streets, and they don't have to worry about air pollution, noise pollution, they can do their homework in peace. So it's also very much about the environment, but also, yes, it is a, a whole lot safer than the inner city. On a un appartement nickel super neuf. On aura un équipement super neuf. Et j'attends mon, mon petit mois dedans, là, <laughs> <laughs> qui sera aussi super neuf. Hein? Olivier and Naomi have found their safe haven. Beginning with a new life for us. Yes. Demand to live in this new residence is growing. Eventually, La Cité de Fleuve will have more than 2,000 homes, including that of the singer Fali Ipupas. We find him in a large house, which he has rented as the backdrop of his new music video. The extras are dressed up as Congolese warriors. The day starts well for Fali, but all of a sudden, the music stops, for there has been a power cut in the area. Fali and his team are stuck. Finally, a technician manages to get his hands on a generator, but that quickly breaks down too.
Fali is desperate, even though he is used to such disappointment. Manon, Fali Ipupa's assistant, uses the car's sound system to finish filming the clip. On fait avec les moyens du bord. On va connecter à la voiture en attendant le courant. Pas de choix. Thanks to this trick, shooting can finish without a hitch. In his 20-year career, Fali has earned several million pounds. He has had a huge success, which is not necessarily an anomaly in this country. <laughs> Congo's underground is rich in minerals, which have helped make the fortune of several well-advised men. One of the main resources is coltan, which, once it's been transformed, is used in the manufacturing of mobile phones. The mines are in the Great Lakes region, in the east of the country, on the Rwandan border. In Goma, the capital of North Kivu, Conflicts have been raging for over 20 years. Armed groups are trying to seize the land's wealth. The UN permanently deploys 16,000 peacekeepers to maintain a semblance of peace in the region. The region is very poor, traumatized by successive rebellions and massacres. Those who have made their fortune, especially in raw materials, live in the luxurious Lake Kivu. One of the region's most important businessmen lives in this huge villa. There is a watchtower with a huge police presence at the entrance. It's a true fortress. Its owner has several tens of millions of pounds. Robert Seninga is the king of the coltan mines. He has had an eventful life. Formerly, he was a rebel leader. Today, he is a businessman and also a member of the Maisi Parliament, a district near to Goma. La politique, quand on est député, ça nous empêche pas à faire euh, du business. He even admits that his power has helped him to become an owner of some of these mines. Robert Seninga is also the president of one of the largest corporations extracting coltan in this region. He is always escorted by armed guards, as he regularly receives threats. On est où ici? Ici, on est au siège de la Coperama. C'est le siège social, là où les activités de commerce des minéraux se font. The building does not pay for the mine but the cooperative earns millions in turnover every year. Robert Seninga gives an update on coltan production over the last few days. And the numbers are pretty good. Robert Seninga prefers to remain discreet. These last few days, the mines have given a lot to the cooperative and to their owners, almost two million pounds. The businessman employs 3,000 people to achieve these results. He claims to be a faultless boss. Helmets, boots, and masks are mandatory in the mines to ensure the worker's safety. In fact, the site could be a model example for the region. These mines are situated 60 kilometers from Goma, in a beautiful region of North Kivu, with hills and pastures as far as the eye can see.
It is also one of the most dangerous regions in Africa. It has been at war for over 25 years. In 1995, one of the worst tragedies of the 20th century broke out in Rwanda, a genocide which would kill almost one million people. Hundreds of thousands of survivors fled to the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo and North Kivu in particular. But militants who took part in the massacre joined the exodus. Since then, this region in the east of the Congo has been extremely volatile. Dozens of rebel groups are clashing and, in particular, they are trying to capture some of the Congolese underground wealth. Landry Robert Seninga's chief engineer accompanies us to his mines. Seninga is the Moïse, the sauveur of the local community of Masisi. Because thanks to Mr. Robert Seninga, the activities and life is passed normally. Yet little seems to have changed in the region in recent years. The road is in a terrible state. Every day, people risk their lives in order to work. Our car struggles to get to the ravine, despite several attempts due to crevices full of water. Ça se joue à quelques secondes près. Non, sinon on allait se retrouver après quelques secondes on allait se retrouver dans cette rivière là, et là on serait foutu. Fatal accidents are common on this road. Oh, génial, on est sauvé. It will take us a total of five hours to travel just 60 kilometers. On arrive. This is Rubaya, a town near the mining site. The town has boomed recently, growing exponentially in just a few years. Today, 10,000 people live here practically cut off from the outside world. Life is organized. There's a sewing workshop, a hairdresser's, and even something that's turned its inside into a nightclub. In Wobaya, everything has been created to meet the needs of the population that has come to take advantage of this new Congolese Wild West. Robert Seninga's face is displayed everywhere. According to Landry, his loyal follower, he can make all dreams possible. Je vous présente cette maison d'un creuseur, celui qui avait commencé à travailler dans le dans le premier trou découvert aux alentours de Rubaya. Il est parvenu à construire cette très belle maison que vous voyez ici. An economic miracle seems to be taking place. But upon closer look, most homes are simple wooden shacks. Gilles lives here with his wife and their three children. With five people living in 15 square meters of space, they are forced to be very tidy. In the other room, the kitchen is attached to the family bed. The couple moved here five years ago when Gilles wanted to earn his fortune in the mines. For now, Gilles only earns five euros per day. He works 10 kilometers from the center of Rubaya and must travel for an hour and a half to get there. Hundreds of coltan extraction sites surround the area. Gilles is called Bamfu. Every day, it filters coltan mixed with sand that is extracted from the mine.
Hapa niko natumikisha mikono. Beshi natumikaka kisha mikono sasa nayo inasukura mzuri mzuri na kamati. Coltan is this black substance. Once transformed, it goes into the manufacturing of microelectronic components. Later on, Jill has to go into the mine to dig. The wall is very slippery. And there's no safety measure to rely on along this 15 meter descent. Once you've arrived at the bottom, it is difficult to breathe. Tons of sand have already been extracted, which has opened up tunnels. There is no supporting structure to secure them. So the risk of a landslide is very high. Jill extracts the coltan using just his hands. Priority is given to extraction, never safety. There are regular accidents in these mines. But Landry, our guide, doesn't see the problem. There are no official figures, but men regularly lose their lives extracting coltan. Upon leaving, we notice that some of the miners seem very young. Landry seems embarrassed. Of Gilles' 30 or so colleagues, at least half don't seem to be older than teenagers. This site isn't an anomaly. We meet a lot of children in the region who hide from the camera. According to UNICEF, mines allegedly employ 40,000 children. This mineral, which is generating fortunes, steals these children's childhood and sometimes even their lives. Two months before filming, a massacre took place one evening in the center of Rubaya. Three men, armed with machetes, launched an attack. Twelve were killed, including three women and a five-year-old child. It was undoubtedly a settling of scores over the coltan black market that plagues the region. Underground reselling of coltan happens at all levels of the production chain, from miners to site managers. Much of the product is sold illegally to avoid paying taxes to the Congolese government. In Goma, we pose as traders wanting to buy smuggled coltan. We made an appointment with traffickers. The traffickers present us with different coltan samples to try and convince us. According to these sellers, the coltan comes from the place where we just left. This coltan is tax-free. At this price, the traffickers are responsible for delivering the goods across the Rwandan border. The country is regularly accused of stimulating economic growth through smuggled raw materials from the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
This theft takes place with the help of Congolese soldiers. Like this man, who lets the convoys pass through. Like all Congolese civil servants, this soldier only gets a small salary. The DRC is one of the 20 most corrupt countries on the planet. In total, corruption costs the Congolese state 11 billion pounds every year. Despite all of this trafficking, the mining sector drives the DRC's economy. The country's economy has grown by almost 6% in 2018, thanks to this industry. This economic success is showcased in Kinshasa, the capital, around the Boulevard du Trang Juan. The 30th of June is their Independence Day, which was granted after almost a century of Belgian rule. Here in the business district, we find Olivier, the young banker who moved to the Cité de Fleuve a few weeks ago with his wife, Naomi. I like this. I like the fruit ones. Which one? The, the, the apple tart. When I was in France, there existed not encore ça. These pastries cost four pounds each, the same price as in the UK. They're a luxury in Kinshasa. Twenty-one pounds is almost the country's average salary, but that doesn't seem to bother Olivier. Tu pas cher, ça va. Although these well-paid executives only make up a tiny part of the population, new businesses are slowly but surely being set up in the city center. This new clientele, used to the Western way of life, must be catered for. This supermarket has adapted its stock. From coffee capsules to European cheeses to cereal, you can find everything here that is sold in rich countries. But they have to pay a huge price for all of these imported products. 31,000. How many dollars? That's about $20. Really? It's too expensive for anyone, really. I can't speak for other people, but. No, for you. $20 is expensive for me. I wouldn't spend that kind of money on juice. Most of the imported products are very expensive. A four pack of yogurts comes to almost eight pounds, a box of cereal is 10 pounds. That's three times more expensive than in the UK. You know the perception that people at Levitt yeah, have? Just, yeah. When they hear of Congo, they think war, they think the jungle, they think civilized people. Uh, this type of supermarket in the city center is attracting more and more well-off clients, as well as those who have lived abroad, like Olivier and Naomi. I can't imagine myself going to the market because that's the first thing I thought when I was here. I thought, oh my gosh, when I live on my own, I need to start going to the market and buying things, you know, in the flea market and whatnot. But yeah, if, they, if this didn't exist, I don't know if we'd eat. <laughs> Naomi makes sure that she eats a balanced diet because she is pregnant. It will be a boy. He's due in three months. It's a baby boy. I'm a little bit nervous, but happy at the same time. I think it's just like first time parents, we've never raised another human before. <laughs> <laughs> this is the perfect outcome for the couple who have had time to settle down. Yo, the table is full. Huh? I think we're done. <laughs> <Most blind. laughs> little by little, their apartment is becoming more homely. Thank you for this meal. 
We thank you for you and Jesus. This meal gives them a chance to consider their child's future, which will most likely be in the Democratic Republic of Congo. If he wants to be a doctor today, we have the money to pay for the medicine. If he wants to be a sportif, we have enough money to put him in an academy and do football, do basketball. I want him to be an entrepreneur. Why? Because I want him to be his own boss. And I don't want him to, to spend his life working for somebody else. An entrepreneur, the job that young Congolese people dream of. The job is demanding, but the success more than makes up for it. This evening, an entrepreneur is celebrating an exciting new contract. He is called Eric Monga. This business leader is also at the top of an employer's union. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's friends are drinking only the best champagne. They are celebrating good news. The businessman has just come back from Florida in the USA, where he met with investors. He is in the process of convincing them to fund his project, which is certainly ambitious and which will cost upwards of 250 million pounds. <laughs> Négocier un contrat qui a abouti, que je ne peux pas dévoiler ici, ça, ça vaut la peine de prendre quand même un verre de champagne par rapport au contrat que notre ami vient de négocier. Eric wants to construct what will be one of the Congo's largest dams. Today, less than one in five Congolese people are connected to the electricity network. Eric is hoping to fill part of this gap with this new project. Chaque fois que nous sommes devant un problème, Il y a une opportunité d'affaires qui vient derrière. La population doit manger, la population doit se vêtir, et nous, pour l'instant, nous voulons donner l'année prochaine l'électricité à, 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 à la population. In time, Eric will improve the living conditions for some of his 81 million fellow citizens. The businessman is from Lumbumbashi in the south of the Congo. He has made his fortune by creating a company specializing in the analysis of minerals. The entrepreneur is leaving this morning for an expedition on the site of his future dam. Hey, Isaac, on va y aller. It is 350 kilometers away. Eric is looking to check the river's flow rate. But the road is extremely dangerous, and Eric asks his colleagues to be careful. Donc, on vous attend directement à Calera. N'oubliez pas qu'on doit faire la route de jour, hein? On veut pas rouler de nuit. There are no lights, very little signage, and potholes everywhere. The National Road 1 highway, which crosses Katanga, is one of the most deadly roads in the country. Many lorries transporting minerals and chemical products used in the mining industry use this road every day. Drivers on this road will take any risks necessary to ensure timely delivery of their precious merchandise. The roads of Congo, the accidents are numbers. There are conductors fou. Three of the 11 passengers in this vehicle were just killed just a few hours ago. But that doesn't affect these drivers. Eric is worried. A high-speed car suddenly comes by a little too close. Let's go. Despite the low visibility, the driver goes for it. After three hours of difficult driving, Eric can finally breathe a sigh of relief. He leaves the National Road 1 highway to take a long 100-kilometer track, which is used far less frequently. The area where he hopes to set up his dam is currently very remote. In order to construct it, he will have to bring workers in from far away. But the challenge is worth it. Ça va rapporter près de 1 million de dollars par mois. C'est une belle, une belle enveloppe. Et là, oh pardon. 
C'est ça la brousse. In the meantime, Eric has set up a small camp in the middle of nowhere, which hosts a dozen engineers. Vous allez bien ici? Ça va? Bon deal. The employees have been living here for a year completely alone. They have a water tank, a generator, and a small shed for tools. Despite being tired from traveling, this businessman can't waste any time. He leads his team to the bank of the Lufira River, which runs through the dam. Eric checks the height and the speed of the water. Et là, si tu lis, c'est à combien? La hauteur actuelle de l'eau est à 1,63 m. 1,63 m par rapport à l'échelle là-bas. The project has already successfully passed all of the feasibility tests. Nous sommes à peu près à 735 mètres et le barrage va arriver à 830 mètres. L'eau va s'arrêter au premier niveau là, presque à la lisière de là où le soleil s'arrête, au-dessus là-bas. Donc tout ça sera le lac qui sera par là. The project will be one of the five largest in the Congo. With a height of 90 meters, it will produce 150 megawatts of power, which will be able to provide 500,000 people with electricity. It will supply the equivalent of the population of Manchester. The dam's construction is expected to create almost 3,000 jobs and boost the region's economy. Construire quelque chose dans la vie qui reste, qui reste, qui peut servir à toute une communauté, rendre heureux tous les 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 paysans qui n'attendent que ça, qui n'attendent que cette énergie pour se développer. Several large investors, notably Americans, have registered their interest in the project. Eric hopes to gather the 250 million pounds needed for the project in the next three years. Upon returning to the camp, he has a small surprise for his team. Un proverbe ici qui dit Kutoma le kwambaula. Ça veut dire buvez et parlez. He has asked his cook to prepare a celebratory meal of traditional dishes. Ça c'est des ngaingai cultivés à Boari. Boari c'est tout près d'ici. Tout près d'ici. Ça c'est les lingalenga. Lingalenga. Oui, les amarantes cultivées aussi à Boari. À Boari. Donc. Merci. Eric believes that in this country, one of the least developed in the world, there are various opportunities for success. You just need to dare to take a leap and get started. Nous avons vu beaucoup de gens euh, venir au Congo, aller dans là où c'est difficile, là où il n'y a rien, et s'en sortir. Et pourquoi pas moi Voilà, il faut, le Congo, c'est ça. Le Congo, le matin, tu peux te réveiller euh, pauvre, le lendemain, tu, tu deviens riche parce que tu as travaillé. Inspired by the boldness and success of entrepreneurs like Eric, more and more Congolese people are throwing themselves into the world of business in a hope to escape poverty. And this dream motivates thousands of women in Kinshasa every day. They come at 4 a.m. from all parts of the city to stock up on bread from this wholesaler. They buy whatever they can to make a living that day. Marie comes here every day for the 6 a.m. batch. Marie was widowed six months ago and therefore has the huge responsibility of bringing enough home to feed her whole family. Marie is carrying more than 15 kilograms of goods on her head. She sets up her stall in a strategic location every day, which will get her the most clients. Marie 
Thanks to her smile and her kindness, Marie usually attracts a lot of customers. Marie earns 50 pounds per day thanks to this little stand. She believes in her business and dreams of opening other stands like this one. She even allows herself to imagine making a fortune. But there's still a long way to go because Marie's net profit for a day's work is just 15 pounds. And a third of this sum needs to go towards renting a small apartment with a kitchen on the landing. Inside, there is a single room, which is used as a bedroom and living room for Marie and her daughter. Sarah is the youngest of her five children. With a salary higher than 350 pounds per month, Marie could live in a bigger apartment. But she would rather save money on her housing in order to fund her children's studies. <laughs> Their schooling costs her 25 pounds per month, but it will give them the tools they need to encourage them to dream big too. Like 90% of Congolese people, Marie and her daughter Sarah are Christians. They follow the evangelical denomination. The shopkeeper visits a temple three times a week. She thanks God for having spared her from poverty. <laughs> Evangelical churches thrive in the Congo, much like in many other African countries. And by exploiting the Congolese people's strong faith and sometimes their naivety, some religious leaders have become millionaires. This Sunday morning in Kinshasa, all of the city's usually very busy main streets are strangely deserted. Since dawn, tens of thousands of people have been heading towards the largest stadium in Central Africa. Eighty thousand attendees are not there for a football match or a huge concert. They have come to hear a speech from a man who sells a juice which supposedly has extraordinary powers. There are cameramen, photographers, cheerleaders, policemen on alert. It's the biggest event of the year. It is also being broadcast live on television. The star everyone is waiting for is called The Prophet. He lives a few kilometers away from the stadium. We find him at his home where his escort is already ready and dressed impeccably. His bodyguards are also his disciples. Prophet Kun, he is really a man of God, an envoy of God. Il fait vraiment, il fait tout ce que Jésus a fait. Le prophète Kone fait aussi ça. 
Donc, euh, il est vraiment homme de Dieu. C'est notre prophète, c'est Dieu qui nous a envoyés ici dans notre pays. Le prophète Condé est ce homme avec un floral shirt. Dominique, son nom de nom, a créé une église chrétienne dans le Congo, qui a 5 millions de suivants. C'est une histoire de succès qui pourrait faire que les gens soient jaloux. Dominique Condé dit qu'il reçoit des threats Dominique Condé dit qu'il reçoit des threats régulièrement. J'ai subi aussi euh, beaucoup de problèmes, de menaces à mort euh, tout le temps. Des menaces de mort Oui, même en Angola, il y a des criminels qui sont entrés pour venir m'abattre. Ils sont entrés avec des pistolets. In his living room, the so-called prophet is proud to show us his dozens of diplomas. He is recognized as a scientist, a scholar, and a universal minister of peace. Vous êtes un docteur. <laughs> Tout cela, ben, ben, ça peut venir, on peut vous appeler, on peut vous donner beaucoup de titres, mais un jour viendra, on ne serait plus. The prophet doesn't really respond to the question, but this supposedly miraculous juice has made him a fortune, and perhaps that of his church as well. His first clients are these many loyal followers. It is two o'clock. Dominique Condé, surrounded by his armed bodyguards, leaves for the stadium. Mais on est là tout simplement pour euh, essayer de remonter ceux qui sont faibles, de conseiller, de porter des conseils à ceux qui sont dépourvus de moyens, dépourvus d'essence pour qu'ils puissent vivre, même dans la disette, mais avec beaucoup d'essence. Upon arrival, the man is greeted by a cheering crowd. Before going on stage, Dominique Conde greets Bruno Chibala in the crowd, the country's prime minister. After prayers and hymns, the prophet reads his sermon. It is a call for everyone to keep faith in the future. The apparent prophet is a clever man. He does not sell his miraculous juice in public places like this stadium. He dispenses it more discreetly in small parishes scattered around the country. It is thanks to this network that he has already raked in millions of pounds. A few days later, Dominique Conde holds an open session in Mateta in the suburbs of Kinshasa. There are already more than 100 people waiting on the pavement in front of the entrance for a consultation. At 11 o'clock, Domini Conde arrives in his large 4x4 worth several thousand pounds. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Merci. All of his followers have come for his supposedly magical remedy. But before being allowed to get it, you must go to the cash register and make a small donation. Dominique Conde meets a long line of ill people. This woman suffered a brain hemorrhage a year ago. <laughs> Consultations often only last a few seconds. The prescription is always the same. Once they've received a prescription, the ill people are directed towards the room next door, which is the pharmacy. 
This is where you find the famous juice. It is sold in small used water bottles. The followers are convinced that it makes miracles happen. It's a promise with no scientific foundation, which can be a dangerous message for ill people. It costs over 10 pounds for just 500 milliliters of the juice. It's a huge sum, which equates to half of the average salary. As a result, the poorest patients share the costs. The room is letting off a strong smell of petrol. The juice is packed on site. The demand is so high that Dominique Conde will soon have to begin industrial production. He has just received the new packaging. It mentions on the packaging that it cures diseases such as epilepsy, cancer, and even AIDS. How does it have so much power? If he could explain, it would provide a divine inspiration. But when we ask Dominique Conde to read to us what is written on the box, he avoids reading the word AIDS. Ce produit traite des maladies d'origine naturelle ou mystérieuse, telles que l'épilepsie, bon, cancer, euh, etc. Il a écrit que ça guérit du sida, mais vous n'avez pas dit. Du sida, non. Euh, J'ai pas souvent fait mention de cette, cette maladie. In the Congo, around 400,000 people are infected with AIDS. Another false statement that the prophet gives is that his juice supposedly resurrects dead children. While we are in his office, his assistants count and stack banknotes. This scammer sells tens of thousands of bottles every year and doesn't ever worry about getting caught.